All right, welcome back to the Daily Fantasy Flex Podcast. It's Tuesday, which means we're going over some PGA. I'm here with my usual guest, Pete and Colin. How's it going, guys? Colin, what's going on, man? Not too much. Uh, I was actually, um, th- this past week, I don't know how it was with you, Pete, it was a disaster for me, uh, both in the Fantasy Labs League and just across the board. Uh, I was mercifully in Las Vegas this week on vacation, so I didn't get to see any of it. So if there's ever a time we want to be, like, separated from, like, actual reality, it's probably when I'm not, like, getting anybody across the cut. So that was my mixed blessing this week. Uh, so I don't know. How would you end up? I got smashed. Absolutely <laughs> <laughs> lost, lost a lot. I mean, it was so brutalizing because I was looking so good going into Friday. All my guys did well, and uh, I played all the guys the early morning tea times for Friday morning, so they went off late. And because of the delay and moving it forward, they went out early on Friday, but then they played when it was super windy. And, like, Luke List shot, like, a 75. O'Hare shot a 76 on Friday. Uh, Justin Rose played, like, a total donkey the whole tournament with his putter. Um, I mean, everything that could go wrong. Uh, on Friday went wrong, and then it was just like a sweat of uh, how painful is it going to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure we'll get into it in terms of like what did we learn this week, and I think there's some interesting like kind of metagamey stuff to discuss. But uh, I actually had a, like uh, I was actually talking fantasy labs PGA with a bunch of people um, at like the. Uh, Venetian 4-8 game just like talking stuff I had like five nice. people make fun of me for like having opinions on Keegan Bradley is actually pretty <laughs> I think you guys have made fun of me for the same thing too so like he's one of those like you know if we all think about oh which player may you think the most I think this week has to be Keegan Bradley just because like now I've had half a dozen people like make fun of me for it, it was great I actually had this great conversation with uh, you know, shout out to the dude at the 4-8 game in the Atlanta Falcons shirt that I told you to watch this thing if you're out there uh, I was asking him, like, and seriously, I'm trying to learn, what, what, what do you not like about Keegan Bradley? I, I'm a data guy. What do I miss? And, like, he just deadpan. Like, I'd tell you, but he hasn't been on TV all year, so I have no idea. And it was just the most, like, subtle, like, just mic drop. Like, yeah, he's that bad. You're terrible for having an opinion on him. Um, so that was – it was a nice vacation week, both from watching or even, like, paying attention to lineups and just everything. The, the, narr- the narrative on Keegan is once he signed with Jordan, it was all downhill. So, oh, okay. There, there, there's a the narrative. And, yeah, I mean, Colin, if you watch golf, there's literally no one worse where, where he'll three putt and he'll miss like a foot and a half foot putt to miss the cut. He does, <laughs> he does shit like that all the time. Just like where you just possibly can't think he could fuck you any worse. And sorry for all the language up front of the pot. But well, it's, it's Keegan talking, Bradley. I'm invoking cl- – I knew this would happen. So. When we talk about Keegan Bradley, I mean, he's just – brutalizing and what and i'm also really biased because one of my good friends grew up playing golf with him and uh yeah he he's he's he uh he beat him in in college and he took his money from playing him in fantasy so we we all yeah we hate keegan bradley <laughs> god I'm, I'm glad he's not playing this week either he might pop all well in course fit too and everything but all yeah, right always, he pops every week dude yeah. <laughs> every single week his yeah. long term his long term adjusted round is just it's still solid because he used to be pretty good now he sucks yep <laughs> yeah uh all right good good keegan discussion to begin the pod um yeah so let's let's talk about what we learned last week um if we learned anything uh, which actually I, I think is going to be sort of an interesting conversation. Uh, we had talked uh, in our conversation off the pod. Um, I, I had mentioned uh, Smiley Kaufman had uh, posted a tweet, said that, hey, I'm dropping out of this week's tournament. I've been dealing with some uh, wrist tendonitis uh, in the last several weeks uh, dating back to the Masters. Um, and so really all this ties in together because I think the Smiley thing is interesting. We've talked about, you know, in the past, um, you know, how do you sort of judge data when it's uh, tinted by injury? You know, uh, it's going to throw off uh, both recent and long-term stats. It's not really reflective of who they are because it's an injury. And really, this this past weekend, you know, it's not super reflective of a player's um, sort of talent when they're having to deal with just crappy, crappy weather and sitting and stopping and um, all sorts of things. So uh, I guess when we're talking about what do we learn, it's, you know, how, how do we deal with data like this as well? Colin, I'll start with you. Um, in individual sports, the, the shortcut, and I really don't have a good answer beyond like, is you don't, um, with individual sports, your assumption is pretty much always if they're injured enough, like they're not like, they're just not going to play. You can withdraw at any time. That was the way I dealt with it with tennis. 
Um, and it seems to be largely true in golf. I don't know that like plenty of people are not shy about like if they're not feeling it, like they don't feel the need to play. So I think if any a sport assum- like assumption would hold up in terms of like guys will not play through injury, it's going to be golf. It's like they're, it, it pays pretty well. You can afford to miss a game or two, maybe unlike all the other sports, like where like if you're like a bench guy or something, you can't afford to, you don't have the luxury of sitting out because like, you know, you're under contract or something. So that's a long way of saying I do nothing. Uh, and it's maybe not the best thing to do, but it's, it's like um, you could fold in some sort of injury tracker, but it'd be really difficult to ascertain someone's like health from afar as far as what percent are they at? How would you know what their percent? Maybe you could do some sort of like cloud. They're playing under a cloud of injury during this period and wait everything less, but that's a lot of legwork to try to like essentially backfill that and that, you know, no come forward. And I really don't think that it, it would change a whole lot of decisions, maybe an edge case, like one or 2%, but um, yeah, it, it sucks when people are like, you don't know they're playing under the weather, but I think, I just treat it as the cost of doing business. Um, Pete, you probably have a little bit more subjective leeway in terms of like, since you actually look, cover those angles, like what, what weight do you give it? Like if someone's popping otherwise, like. Well, I, I get to disagree with you, Colin, to a degree. Okay. I, I agree with you for the most part, but golf, uh, especially for certain types of players. And I think this is what you have to kind of analyze. And I think there's actually probably a small edge in this. Uh, guys who are, let's say like 120th and worst, or guys who are, you know, kind of on the fringe of the PGA Tour, they're going to have to go out there and just play, even if they're hurt, even if, no matter what, just because they need to keep their tour status. And every check on the PGA Tour for someone who's like a fringe web.com or, you know, an Asian tour player is now getting an opportunity at the PGA Tour, those are life-changing checks for those guys. So I think with certain players uh, that are on the lower end, obviously we're not going to be taking them very often, but you at least should be cognizant that they're probably – you know, there's some reason that they had like a bad round recently, or there's something that you saw that made you a little concerned. I put a lot of weight into it on, on those guys, you know, the studs, the Rory McIlroy, Spies, all these guys who are, you know, you know, they're on the tour, they're on the tour, they have exemptions forever. They have tons of money. I think you're totally right, Colin. Uh, I think that you're not going to have to worry too much about them. They're going to tell you when they're hurt, they're going to be pretty honest with the media. Um, You know, they have nothing to lose really by being honest. So uh, I think it's it's a, a thing that you can definitely gain an edge on, too, if you're just hanging around on tour, uh, going to a lot of these events. I think golf and tennis are both similar in that regard. If you could pick up just a little bit of information from hanging around the scene, I think you'd have a big edge just on swing changes or injuries. Um, but again, I think I disagree and I agree. I think overall, you're mostly right, Colin. I just think there's a couple of fringe circumstances that you can take advantage of. And I definitely think those things are important because it's hard to find edges in golf. No, I, that actually makes complete sense to me in terms of like there, I mean, there's a bubble in every single sport in terms of you can't like at some point, no, you can't afford to take off a tournament because you know, the web.com or the Latino America tour just doesn't pay as well. And like, this is your shop to get your card or whatever. Um, to bring it back to um, Brian's original case, do you think Smiley qualifies as like, I mean, he's, what, what do you kind of rookie as? Do you count him as like a can't afford to take off a tournament? No, or? I don't. I don't think so. I mean, he's not going to miss the Masters, obviously, but okay. you know, he's he's out there uh, partying in the Bahamas with Jordan Spieth and Justin Thomas and Ricky Fowler. I mean, he's he's clearly plugged in. He's young. He's super talented. I don't think there's like a huge concern for him. Obviously, he's, he's still, ahead of him. yeah, he still has to prove himself, but. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't think he's like – like right now, he's openly honest. Like if, if he really needed to continue to play to make money, he would continue to play through the wrist tendonitis, I'm sure. He's a young guy. But uh, I think he's being smart here. And the other interesting thing is uh, Dustin Johnson pulling out, which uh, mm-hmm. pretty certain that has to do with uh, the drug test that he might have to take uh, at the next tournament he plays. So Interesting. No, I'd love to see that on like a, a – almost like a DNP cocaine or something like that for his stat line. <laughs> it's literally, literally what it is. Did you – like there's this ridiculous picture on Instagram of uh, him and his wife, uh, Paulina Gretzky, who's just a total smoke mm-hmm. show, obviously Wayne Gretzky's wife. Very much so, yeah. Yeah, I've heard yeah. of cocaine in human form, actually. That's my favorite description of her. <laughs> exactly. And they, they are just living large, and he has that look in his eye. And Yeah. I mean <laughs> – <laughs> Cocaine's a hell of a drug. What are you yeah. going to do? <laughs> oh, Dustin. Oh, yeah. man. Um, all right. So, so Colin, so like a, a situation like Smiley, obviously it's going to sort of tint the, uh, the, the data going back. But do you think there's potential edge of, you know, when he comes back, maybe the data is going to not say he's um, going to play or the data is not going to be as good as perhaps 
um, if he's fully healed and the wrist not going to bother him as maybe he has the potential to play? Um, I actually might go the opposite because there's a guy in the field. I, I, I don't know. You're talking about the comeback, right? Like how do you evaluate the comeback after injury? Yeah, pretty much. It yeah. actually kind of skews the opposite. The closest proxy I have for the comeback is like you could measure like which guys have all the data points in the past and like they still have like a decent volume, but it's all backloaded. And generally the guys that take an extended layoff, I mean, like, so like in the case of Smiley, if he's going to be back in like four weeks, that's functionally no different than like other guys who just take off four weeks because right. That happens from time to time. But for, but for extended layoff periods, there actually is like you, you ding them a little bit and there's grounds for like, maybe you call it rust or whatever, but there's an empirical case for like knock them down a little bit. Uh, and the guy that fits that really well this week, and we'll get into it when we get picks, is Jim Furyk, who hasn't played in, you know, forever. Um, on his own, his long-term adjusted round, like, because he still has results from last year, he's pretty good. But he hasn't played golf in, what, how many months? Like, five, six? Like, it's been a while. Um, I think he's going to be a little bit too high in player models this week because that's one of those, like, you know, there's no slider for extended layoff just because, like, that just doesn't happen for most guys. Um, but that's, I think, more – I go the uh, – um, ding them if they've been away for a while and there's a case of doing that and that's data backed yeah that's interesting yeah it seems like maybe these sort of a case-by-case basis on a lot of these questions um okay enough about guys that aren't playing this week Uh, let's get into our tournament uh, that we got going on it's the wells fargo championship uh it is taking place um in charlotte at uh, Quail Hollow Club, um, my neck of the woods. Uh, so that's pretty exciting. Uh, so we'll kind of go over the course and, and let you give uh, your course fit, Colin. Uh, first, we'll go over sort of little past history. Uh, Rory just crushed the field last year. He set the record there, uh, minus 21. Uh, before that, J.B. Holmes won, Derek Ernst, Ricky Fowler, Lucas Glover going back. Uh, we've seen some pretty high scores. Uh, so I, it's sort of like last week, I think, Birdie. Potential is going to be important, uh, you know, racking up those birdies. Um, weather, it looks like we're actually going to have a, a good a good week um, after sort of dealing with the insistent rain uh, all day, um, every day last week. It uh, looks like we're going to have uh, sunshine and, uh, and some pretty good weather for golf. So that's uh, good to uh, good to hear. Uh, so let's let's get into the course fit. Um, Colin, I'm curious uh, what, what sort of course, uh, what player types are fitting in your model? So first glance says it's kind of a weird mishmash like last time, but it leans a little bit more heavily towards bombers this week. I think distance pops maybe like three quarters after that. And then after that, it's, I think there's kind of this weird mix of bad putters get a little bit of a boost and like a tiny bit of scrambling. Um, the big names that pop percentage wise who fits well, um, Let's see. Um, Tony Finau is like number one, uh, followed shortly by a name we haven't seen in a while, Ali Schneiderjans. Uh, and then after that, you have people like Patrick Rogers, Grant Ballette, Gary Woodland, Brandon Steele's up there again this week. So welcome back to the crazy train. I can't wait. Um, but yeah, I, if you had to pick one this week, uh, I'd go distance. It seems to be every one of the three courses we talk about is just important anyway. Uh, but yeah, I go distance. Sure. Does that jive with what you're seeing? Yeah, I think it's a distance course, and I think all the guys that we like are popping, and some familiar faces that might not be the best putters, but uh, they're cheap enough that you can uh, warrant taking them. So I think there's uh, some of the usual suspects and uh, a couple of other names that we'll have to, to dive into. So that definitely makes sense. And again, that same driving concept for most of these courses is going to be applicable because DraftKings rewards were birdies and eagles. So Mm-hmm. You know, just something that's always gonna gonna pop with the scoring that we have. Colin, uh, one thing that I noticed um, in the article I wrote Monday, and actually uh, Sean can kind of confirm this in his course breakdown today. Uh, it seemed that accuracy seems to be pretty important. Uh, they, there's some narrow fairways, um, some water around these par fours, a lot of par fours, um, and uh, it, it seems like accuracy, especially maybe um, in, in some of these longer par fives and longer par fours. Uh, getting uh, the ability to to get on uh, with these narrow fairways seems to be important. You're not seeing that at all. Um, I get, I probably if it's I I could buy that actually. That I think that kind of falls into that whole like maybe 25 percent of this weird mishmash. Okay. Um, I could I could buy accuracy as I mean I still think distance is like three quarters of it. Yeah. Um, and like the weird thing to kind of piece out there is distance and accuracy are 
so often negatively correlated um, that it's like, I mean, I can see like, the, oh, you have to be good at both type of thing. And like that really like kind of pops naturally. I actually want to do an article about that going forward in terms of like, you know, we talk about all these key statistics and stuff like that, but they're so intercorrelated that like that, that like it helps us start thinking about like, um, just knowing that that's the case and then your mind start thinking about like, you know, like isolated power or isolated pudding and stuff like that. That's way down the road. But um, and to answer your question, like, yeah, I could do like if you gave me like a some sort of weird total driving, like, you know, distance plus accuracy hmm. or something like that. Yeah. I mean, I still think it's three quarters distance. distance yeah. And maybe, yeah, I mean, just if you have to pick one, just make it distance this week. Fair enough. Okay. Uh, before we get into uh, to our, our player analysis where we go through our tiers, um, I always send you guys some questions that I uh, like to dive into. We went over one of them, um, which was sort of the, uh, you know, how to deal with data with, uh, you know, whether it's a tournament with a lot of weather issues or an injury like Smiley that we saw. Um, the other question that I had is, um, which I really think is going to shape sort of how we start with our player analysis and really how we deal with this entire slate. Uh, if you look at the implied Vegas odds, uh, Rory is just really, really high. He's at implied odds of 20%. Um, and I actually looked uh, back in our database and it's like, uh, that's like a top five percentage mark. Um, he's like one of the, the highest marks that we've seen in our database. Uh, he destroyed this course last year. Like I said, uh, he set the record at minus 21. Uh, and other than that, it's not like it was like he just came in randomly and did it. He's got a great course history. Um, he really just crushes this course all the time. Um, so I guess we can start out with this and sort of transition uh, easily into our, our elite players. What do you do with Rory? I mean, he's expensive. You know, he's usually a guy you want to fade. I know Colin, you like fading the guy who won last year, but, um, you know, what do you do? P, I'll start with you. Like, how are you treating Rory this week? I bet my response is the same as Colin. I'm probably going to fade him because I can get really high quality golfers for significantly cheaper. All that upside, the 20% to win is priced in. Look at his price compared to some other studs in the field. I mean, look at him versus JB Holmes, look at him versus Henrik Stenson, versus Justin Rose, even. All these guys are, you know, really good golfers. Like, the field has some guys that are, are pretty solid here. And while Rory definitely is the best, and I, you know, if I had to take one person, I would absolutely take him. Um, I would, I'm, I'm liking my lineups better when I put in JB Holmes and someone else expensive, whoever you want it to be, Justin Rose, uh, whoever Stenson doesn't matter. I just think, uh, I think that he's uh, all that stuff's priced in. So. I'm probably not going to have too much of them in cash games, maybe more in tournaments. So is it okay, like sort of just as a um, thought exercise and strategy exercise, is it okay to not have Rory if you still think that he's going to win the tournament? Or is if you like are really confident he's going to win, you sort of have to have him? Well, it's just what, what it depends on how confident too. And the other thing that we'll talk about that really dictates if you're going to take Rory or not is how much you like the really the cheaper players. So mm -hmm. I like some guys more in the mid-range and some of the, you know, towards the top. I guess top mid range slash kind of lower end of the expensive range. So roster construction is going to be a big part of it as well, but I don't think he's like a massive price. Yeah. You know, his price isn't inefficient. I think his price is, you know, it's where it probably should be. So um, I'm trying to take guys who are underpriced and that, that's, it just depends if there's, if there, again, if there, we'll talk about some lower guys, but for me personally, so far looking at the week, uh, I'm probably not going to have him in cash. Colin, what are you doing with Rory? Yeah, I mean, like, I I feel like a broken record at this point. Like, the, I'm okay fading the top price guy in cash pretty much every single week. I think that was literally my article last time, where just like you're, it, uh, and we talked about it a little bit before, your ability to roster the top guys depends less on what they're going to do and more on your ability to fill out the rest of the your slots. Essentially, in order to roster like a 12-8 guy, you need to be super confident about finding amazing value at the lower end of the tiers. And just, I don't think that that confidence exists in golf like it does in other sports. Like there's no obvious source of value. Like the only way that you can really roster them is you get like, I think win differential is pretty much the only thing that creates value in between uh, salaries and lineup lock, right? In terms of conditions that change that like where players will be better at one price than another. And you just don't find usually enough value generated to roster top guys in cash games. Um, I mean, and when you say like, if you're really confident that like, you know, he's going to win the tournament, like, 
I don't think you should ever be more than, you know, one in four chance of winning the tournament confident in a guy. That just, that's just not golf. It's random like that. There are 150 players in the field. It's a noisy game. Um, if you want to take a flyer on him and, like, the stars align for a couple of, like, all right, you got your five value guys, and, yeah, throw a tournament flyer on him, absolutely. Um, and if anything, like, that's, like, where you cash in. If you like, that's the way to cash in on your ability to spot value because it's going to be equally hard for everyone else to fit in uh, him in the lineup. But in cash, yeah, like, it's just 1900 between the first and the second is a huge amount of money. And, like, you can just buy a better – roster by uh trading down so to speak and then filling them out with more balance at least in cash yeah i I agree with you guys it's fun to play devil's advocate but i do think it's sort of an interesting topic you know there's probably diminishing returns there like at what point would you take them you know if he went down to 12 5 would you take them uh yeah what so what's yeah what's my point for hang on i think yeah it just depends where you want to take them i mean um again it's going to come down to roster construction uh, a lot, but he's probably a clear value of maybe like 11, five, I would think. I haven't really run the numbers. But. Yeah, no, 11. I actually was playing the, like the 11, five, I could take him. I could maybe even fit him at like 11, eight, 11, nine, like in like the Justin Rose type, like last week. Um, but yeah, like anything over 12, I just, no, I can't pull trigger. If you're talking tournament wise though, I mean, he's still like if you're talking like a guy that you think is going to win and get you that extra bonus on DraftKings, he's still he still might be like I was looking at sort of where his price at his Vegas implied odds was compared to sort of historically what we'd expect it to be, and it's it's not ridiculous. So yeah, like he's, he's still rating really well too. Yeah, but. yeah I I think we all have him as our like top rated. Like yeah. he is expected to do the best, but just. Yeah. 12-8 is a lot of money. A lot of money. Yeah. And, and in cash, you're right. Roster construction is key more so than getting the one guy who's going to win. Um, right. Yeah, but it's a good question. And I, and I think people really, uh, everyone that's going to listen to podcasts and sort of uh, ingest um, DFS, PGA content this week is really just going to have to figure out what they're going to do with Rory. That's sort of step number one, and then you can try to move on to the rest of it. Um, okay, let's uh, let's get into the the player analysis here. So we're going to go through our tiers. Uh, if you haven't listened before, we go through three separate tiers. The first one is nine thousand or more on DraftKings. Uh, the middle tier is going to be seven thousand to eight nine, uh, and then the lower bargain bin is going to be six nine or less. And we'll kind of go through and give our favorite plays uh, in each tier, and then we'll sort of talk um, analysis and roster construction uh, in between. Uh, so let's start uh, the elite tier. We've obviously talked about Rory, but other other than him and maybe including him, uh, you know, who do you like? Colin, I'll start with you. All right. Number one, as Pete predicted, who seems always to come up when he's here, is uh, J.B. Holmes. Um, I just, especially at his price point, too, I think he just has the distance. I think he has a decent course fit. Um, I think his history was uh, – what is his history? His history is actually pretty good yeah, um, in good. terms of like the one-size-fits-all metric I have here. I'm pulling – what is his exact history? He won this before. Um, yeah, he won it two years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, yeah, he's got a decent amount of, like, missed cuts and stuff. But, like, there's an – it's, like, maybe a little, like, alternating between, like, you know, miss the cut half the time and put up, like, top 20s otherwise. Um, I think it's a pretty good course history. Um, and he's got a decent course fit. And the other guy that is fi- I'm finally happy to see returning to my favorites is Hideki Matsuyama, who I've just always loved to play before. And I think his recent spate of results has just been really good. Um, if you look at his horse, the thing that dominates his like 2016 so far, and even recent results, uh, is withdrawals. And like that, it depends on like that's actually a kind of a good segue to what we're doing with injury before. Um, because, you know, some guys, um, they, if they're not feeling it, any health issues, whatever, they will withdraw mid-tournament. And, like, that's kind of the more awkward in between. What do you do with those results? Uh, I don't throw them out, but I don't give them full weight. And so if you're willing to discount some withdrawals, then um, he's rating maybe higher than he would otherwise. But other than that, like, he's got a bunch of good top ten finishes here. Um, I think he's kind of back to his old form. And – I think uh, he, at 9,300, it's pretty easy for me. So those are hands to my favorite in the top. Everyone else, like I can say, I mean, no one really excites me, even Phil with this great course history. And it is the best course history in the field, to be clear. 
Um, I just think that's priced in too much and he's a little too expensive. So Holmes and Matsuyama, that's who, that's, that's pretty much my auto lock for this week. Cool. Yep. Love both those plays. I think that's kind of what I was referencing before. Uh, they're both great plays this week in general. And I think they'll be somewhat popular, uh, in cash games and in tournaments. The other guy that's rating well in my model currently is Hendrick Stenson. And, uh, mm. if you do think accuracy matters, um, a lot, he is so good with his three wood. He hits his three wood like 285 every time and he hits a dead straight and he tries not to bring out the driver very often. And he just kind of rides that three wood and, um, he's really accurate with it. So, if there's a lot of holes that set up well for that, which I think there is based on looking at the holes and, and some of the stuff I've read. Um, he's kind of one of those guys where it's like, well, obviously the guys who are accurate hit the ball far, um, they're going to pop, you know, like they're, those are the good golfers, but Stenson, uh, you know, if you can find a course where he's going to be able to hit his three wood confidently and it's the right play a lot, uh, it, it makes me a little bit more bullish on him. So I like him. I don't like him quite as much as Matsuyama or Holmes, but I think he's a good play. Uh, the one thing I wanted to ask Colin just real quick about Matsuyama, I don't think it's a red flag at all, and I was just looking at the courses, but that's probably why, but uh, Matsuyama's recent driving distance is significantly lower than his long-term driving mm -hmm. distance. Not significantly, but it's, it's lower. Is that ever a concern for you, Colin? Um, I mean, I had I, I do fold in. like I try to fold it in as best as I can. Like Whenever I'm doing like you know, key player stats and stuff like that, I do a time-weighted average, So and like it is, it follows like it's – decently heavily weighted towards recent. Um, so in theory, it should pick up that kind of stuff. Um, right. It's not huge. It's, I thought it was a little bit bigger. I think it's like eight. No, nine. yeah, that's that's just not enough to, for me to – I think that, yeah, it, it's it's just not enough, not compared to, uh, say, like I think a bigger difference is someone like Ricky Fowler who, like, the drop-off just continues for him, and that's generally why it's not popping. Um, I don't want to let you, but before I forget though, I don't want to let you go on that Stenson pick because that's the one I might actually disagree with. Sure. Um, oh, I like in, in theory, too. if you're right, then that should be borne out in course history where he's able to play that accurate through when it plays to his strengths. And yet Henrik Stenson not only has the worst course history in the field, but one of the worst relative to his ability that I've seen, like in pretty much any like field, most of the times, like, Sure. I'm kind of guessing here, like if a guy doesn't do well at a course, he doesn't have to show up unless it's a sponsored thing. Normally they won't play that. I don't see why he keeps coming back because it's like a – it's a barely make the cut and three missed cuts. Um, at, at some point, like doesn't that – like at what point does that refute your hypothesis a little bit? Because we've had – we have a decent sample, right? Refutes it right away. Done. I mean, maybe like, maybe he knows his data and knows that he's a good course fit. So that's why he's. I, 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 I don't know. He's popping and everything, but I do see a big red number in course form, and you know that was a strictly just a guess. He was popping super high in my models, but uh, yeah, I mean, but his data says that he should play this course well. He's not a great putter. So and he I, have, I, I actually there, right? I, have him, I have him as a neutral course fit. I don't have him that great because I remember distance is three quarters of it, and he's just not a distance guy. Yeah, he hits that three wood every time. That's why. Yeah, yeah, his, yeah it's his accuracy. I think that's popping for me. Yeah, I get. That's why I'm. That's why I was kind of like, oh man, if the accuracy is important, then Stenson would have been popping higher. But just like, no, I don't like. I can't like. He's got I the lo be best long term adjusted round score tied with with Rory. Oh yeah, to be clear, like oh yeah, Stenson's a great overall. Like I, yeah. I think great, but just like I like in terms of just like their overall ranking, I think him and Matsuyama aren't that like. He's better than Matsuyama, but not by a whole lot. And just Matsuyama has better better stats and better course history. Fair enough. Okay. Um, so, yeah. So, uh, before we move on to the next tier, I, I guess, you know, we can go over a fade. I assume that you guys both sort of like the fade Rory um, uh, uh, strategy here. But, you know, we still got a bunch of guys that we didn't mention. You know, we have Adam Scott, Ricky Fowler at the top. Uh, anything that you guys want to mention about those guys before we move on to the next year? No, those are actually my next two favorite fades. Um, Ro like Ricky, I tend to fade, I guess, in general more often than most people. And that's semi-consistent with some of the non-DFS advanced stats crowd that says like he's a little bit overrated from time to time. I don't think he's the second best in the field. I'm sure like then you point out that recent versus uh, long-term player stats, you know, his, driving distance is not what it used to be 
Uh, and I'm curious as far as like, I don't know, are, do, are people picking up on that as a coasting on reputation? Uh, I don't know. Uh, and then Adam Scott, again, it's just, I mean, he's, he's fine and stuff. He has a decent course fit, but there's nothing that jumps out that like excites me. He has a decently subpar course history as well. Let me pull it. What, what is exactly the chunk? Yeah. Uh, one eight place and three missed cuts. Um, yeah, I mean, granted, there were like, they were like, most of them were five, six years ago. And that gets into how do you time weight course history, which is an open question in my mind. But if you just do the simple, like, how does he play here? Eh, bad course history. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't like either of those guys that much. Fowler's going to be a really easy fade next next week at the uh, Players Championship. Actually, Rory better than pretty much every guy. That's why is it? Why is an easy fade there? I have no idea. Like what? The... Well, he's going to be so popular if he has a decent week this week. He oh, he, okay, yeah, that makes sense. He okay. won in in you know epic fashion, and people love to take Ricky in general. I swear, like people just love Ricky. It's just one of those things. He's just yeah, I, I, that that probably is it. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure people love to bet on Ricky too. That's probably why the price is that high. He's super popular. I mean, it's yeah, just, that's what it is. Yeah, he's fun to cheer for. Okay. Um, yeah, interesting. Uh, so it seems like we sort of like the the lower tier guys of of this higher tier rather. Uh, so we got Rory at twelve eight, and these other guys in the high tens. But the the guys that we like are um, Masiyama and Holmes, which are the low nines. So maybe we're going to have a really balanced roster this week. I, I think it's kind of what it's looking at. Uh, so let's move on to our next year, which is going to be the 7K to 8-9 range uh, right right below them. So, Pete, I'll start with you. Uh, balanced roster, I, I assume you like a lot of these guys then. Yep, just fired up, all the same names. Uh, Charles Howell III is pretty solid in this spot. Don't love his course history, but he's rating well on my model currently. Love Tony Finau. He's probably the highest rated comp. Talked about him before. Daniel Berger is rating extremely well on my model. Brandon Steele is rating extremely well. Patrick Rogers, Luke List. I mean, I love this range. I think there's a lot of really good plays in this range. And um, yeah, you can you can make love marks. Another guy who the only thing that's a little concerning it doesn't have great course uh, course history here, but it's only uh, two two times I believe he's played it. So we'll see uh, on him. But he's he's rating well. So just a lot of guys. One other player I'll just mention at the end that is probably worst part of the key Bradley's Graham to let, and he's, he's rating somewhat well. So I'll probably play him in a tournament. Colin, I'm sure a lot of those names. Matt. Yeah. You did the usual mid tier thing where you just rattled off all. I mean, like I pretty much agree with like pretty much all of that is Luke list in this tier. I forget. Where is he? At? Oh, he's 6,900. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Just I was missing him there. Okay. Just make, all right. So jump the gun a little bit there, but you know, yeah, got a little excited about him. Sorry. No, it, it, it's fine. Um, what's the only other name that I'm missing in there? Um, Justin Thomas is probably the only name that I'd say you're missing there. And I never know how to feel about him because um, he seems to be very up or down. He's cheap. Um, he's uh, really yeah, cheap. he is cheap. I mean, he's been like a 9,500 before. So let's say, why do I like Justin Thomas so much? Um, so he, hits it, he hits it afar. <laughs> yeah, it's a good course. Uh, yeah, he has so his course history is one top ten finish. So all else being equal, like I mean, I know that some people are like, okay, well, at what point do you need sample size for course history? I think you can like you can discount a little bit, but like all else being equal, like even one top ten finish is a step in the right direction in terms of weight. Um, yeah, he hasn't missed a cut since the beginning of February. Um, I think it's just one of those like I mean, yeah, he like the heritage is when he really like crapped the bed and had the disastrous last round. But like, I don't know. It's one of those, like he, maybe he's in more grinder form type of thing and maybe not the upside to win, but like his long-term average is still too good. I just like, he, I he definitely has the upside to win. I, I like, that's a great call. He, he's, he's another one of those super young, talented golfers. And it didn't surprise me. They fell part of the heritage. That course doesn't fit him, but he, he's, yeah. He's so, got upside. I mean, he's competing with Jordan Spieth his whole life. Like, they were neck and neck in college, and he was supposed to be a prodigy too. So, I mean, not a prodigy, I guess I should say, but he was supposed to be one of these elite young golfers. So, I, I like uh, Yeah, like, okay, well, it's good to know that there's kind of like the DNA is there. So, like, yeah, he's probably – I mean, there's a great chance he makes my way in the lineups and stuff this week. Other guys that are kind of like – kind of that they have a case for – Beyond Han An, I was actually happened. I mentioned him like last week. That kind of, I mean, he was kind of a, a side note there, and that kind of played out. I think he might be a little bit overpriced just because you know recency bias and all that. But like, I mean, it's still like it. You can still find a way there if like you know if, if you see something. 
Uh, Gary Woodland continues to be a decent value pop. Um, I know we talk about him pretty, but he's, he's our sneaky every week guy where we tend to bring him up a lot. Um, and the last guy that I could, like, that's a pretty, I guess, like, from a pure value end, um, that's kind of interesting is Harris English, who I swear he hasn't had a great set of recent results. So I'm kind of curious why he's popping so high. Um, but, like, if you really need to save some more, you could. But I don't know. I think, like, in the, all those guys we talked about, between Howell and Thomas and, like, Berger, that's just there's – you'll find plenty of savings in that mid-range just fine. I don't think you need to dip in the bargain bin that much this week. Yep. Agree. Gotcha. Uh, one guy I want to ask you guys about, because uh, I've seen some people talk about him, and uh, looking at stats, I think he's kind of interesting. Uh, Emiliano Grillo. Um, he's at 7'7 seven, seven on, on DK. Um, and I've been seeing some people talk about him. He's got um, some pretty good recent um, performances. He played pretty well at the Masters. Um, so his sort of a recent and even long-term adjust around is pretty good. He's an accurate guy. Um, his recent driving distance isn't, isn't good. So I'm assuming he's probably not popping for you. But I, I've just seen some people talk about him and not a guy that I uh, know too well. So I just wanted to ask you guys maybe if you had heard or if you're interested in him at all. Any other course, I think he would be a lock. I think he has flown so under the radar for so long. I think I had him in my lineup at the Masters, and he was so under own. He does decently well. He's um, he's gonna. I feel like he's gonna blow up pretty soon. Um, and he's, he's and your he's, future he, Chez. Yeah, like well, no, because like Chez is like. I mean, like Amelia. The difference is Emiliano could actually win a tournament. Was Chez just has like that like thirty second place every single week? Yeah, Chez has been so Daniel. bad lately, though. I know. I, it kills me. Like, I dude, I hope he takes a break and finds his mojo again. That like it hurts me to my soul. Um, I do like to. It, it's a good question because like the, as far as like Emiliano, um, it's pretty much yeah. Any other course, I take him, but he has zero course history. Yeah. Um, and the course fit is like they're just better guys. So uh, pick your spots, keep them on your buy low list, and like these, <clears throat> there he will find a course that fits him better in the next couple of weeks, and you'll be able talk to- about him then. Yeah, cool. And uh, I didn't, I didn't talk about my favorite golfer in the world. Right. <laughs> I know we're gonna. Have to- I, I'm, I'm gonna, let, I'm not gonna talk it's about. It's like him. Voldemort. He you shall not be named. <laughs> keep, keep his ownership low. We can't, we can't hype him at all over here. We're not gonna do that. So. Yeah, Bryce and DeChambeau, got to have some exposure to For him. those that were just still wondering, who who could it be, I wonder, yeah. Yeah. Good old Bryce, and yeah, we have to mention him. Uh, we're, we're obligated at this point. Um, okay, let's uh, let's move on to our last year then. Uh, so it's going to be uh, all golfers on DraftKings, six, nine, or below. So maybe some bargain bins if you want to try to uh, fit in Rory or Stinson or some of these other pricey guys. Uh, you can uh, try to get these guys maybe hit in the tournament and, and get Rory as well. Uh, so, Colin, I'll start with you. Six, nine, and below. So, I swear I mentioned him last week, too. Uh, we have Luke, yeah, Lucas Glover all over again. He is hands down the best value, I think, of the tournament. Um, I think he actually has, like, for, like, so I treat, like, course history for me is, like, I think it's much more fruitful when you do it when you're beating expectations in terms of like, how do you do relative to what you expected? And Lucas Glover is only second to Phil Mickelson this week in terms of consistently beating expectations this course. So you look at like, yeah, it's a bunch of missed cuts and stuff, but it's like there, I mean, again, a, a lot of this happened like, you know, five years ago, but he's won this tournament and he's gotten a second place. Like, and like the rest is like top 30 finishes and missed cuts. Uh, it's really good course history. Um, maybe even if you discount like the, the older stuff and give a little bit of weight, it's just still really good. I just don't see how anybody with that level of course history is 6,300. Um, and that's the biggest thing. I mean, normally I think it's priced in, but it's just popping way too high for me. Um, so who else is here? Yeah. I, I mentioned him briefly at the start, Ali Schneiderjans. Uh, I haven't seen him forever. Do you remember? Do you guys remember that week, like right after the British, when he just turned pro and he was like an eight eighty five hundred player or something like that? Normally, I never like to take like you know rookies like storming out of the gate, like you know, like that. I mean, I've talked about that with Bryson all the time too. But like in the grinding days he spent on the Web dot com tour, like he's got some quietly decent results there and like is getting good and competitive. Mm-hmm. Um, what did he do recently? I think like this. Yeah. So like, if you look at um, his like, He's been the doing month, well, yeah. yeah, the month of April, like, yeah, there's a bunch of bad miscuts, like, uh, like 
earlier, but like if you wait recently enough, like dude's on a tear right now, like a second and a seventh, and a thirteenth on web.com. Yeah, it's still the minor leagues, but like it's that's movement in the right direction. Yeah. Um, and it's like just long term, yeah, just for everything, he's still pretty cheap. Um, and then the other guy that we always seem to mention, I'm happy he's doing well again, is uh, Will Wilcox. Uh, he's been on a decent tear lately. Um, and I think he talked a little bit about how, like, it's starting to click for him. Uh, Pete, I don't know if he weighed that, like, subjectively at all. But, like, he's still – I think his price is pretty low just because the field is so top-heavy that this week that, like, it skews everybody's odds at the bottom. Um, and I think that's why his price hasn't moved up as much as it would have, just as kind of stifled by a top-heavy field. Um, but those are my big guys that I like the most at the bottom. Um, I mean, there are other names too. Scott Pinkney is just so cheap at 5,300. If I had to fit in, like if I had to do two stars and four scrubs, he would definitely be in there. Um, he is just that he's not a 5,300 player. Um, yeah, those are my guys. Yeah, yeah. Wilcox played really well last week. But yeah, who, who you like there? I mean, I don't really have any material after that. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's just Glover was like by far the number one rated. He won here. It's a great play. If you're in a yeah, why is he so cheap? If you're an ox, he's a bad putter. Like, and that's just like that's it. He's like my friend again, guy, another golfer guy. He said he's got as good ball striking. He just hits the ball pure all the time. He just can't putt on green. So that so makes sense that he's uh, you know rating well. And I don't know why he's so cheap, but I think he's a great play. Uh, and then in addition to that, I think he nailed all the other guys that I'd be interested in. I mean, definitely think Pickney's way too cheap. Uh, if you want to play Rory, there's a good way to unlock him and still get a really good roster. So that's it. I mean, list. I should. I mentioned him in the other tier. He's the other guy that I like. And that's kind of it in this range that I'm gonna that I'm gonna take. So, so I don't look like. Yeah, I, I know it's for getting someone. So like Luke List, I feel like I'm missing the boat on him week after week, and it's to the point where because like a lot of sharp people are on him, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like I just I have never he, sixty eight and a seventy five he freaking bogeyed eighteen when he was right there so tilting he hits I the ball mean, I don't like, know why it doesn't rank well for you he hits the ball a mile like all the stats that I think that you're waiting yeah on. no I think he has good course fit I, yeah what is his course fit for me so I think it's good like yeah it's a good fit uh yeah definitely a good fit decent course tester I think he's I just view him as like his I think I have a more pessimistic view of his long term I guess. Um, and I'm sure well, his, long term, his, cuts. his long-term adjusted round is 71.2 and his, you know, his short-term adjusted round 69.3. He's like, I know I didn't, I said before, maybe I didn't buy into the, he's gotten better, but that's what a lot of people are saying. And I'm, yeah, I'm, I think I'm wondering if like, so like when we do time, we do long-term versus recent waiting all the time. And like, you know, like I'm a big believer in like do a one size fits all rule. Maybe some people will turn it around faster than others. And maybe he is one of those guys where maybe I'm underweighting a turnaround that just happened. But yeah, I'm looking like at just his like stretch from November to February. It's um, yeah, six out of seven missed cuts. I think that's just too devastating to his long term. That like that's why he's never going to pop for me. So yeah, that becomes the that's the age old debate of how do you time weight the results. Uh, I'm going by my one size fits all rule. Um, do you guys like Pete? Do you see anything where like there's a visible change that might be like not reflective of a one size fits all rule for him, or is he just on a tear and people are valuing recent results? Um, I think people have mentioned a couple things that he's really come on. I, I haven't personally seen it, but uh, everyone's talking about how he's a different golfer now. So. It is what it is. I don't know. It's, again, a subjective thing. Some things are very easy to, to buy into, and some things are just young talent. Like, if we had a really young golfer, I'd, I'd buy into it immediately. Someone took a leap from, you know, their adjusted round by, like, two mm-hmm. strokes, and they're 24 years old or 25 years old. It's like, well, of course, that makes sense. He got used to being on the tour. He matured. He got older. Uh, but with him, it's 31, I believe. So, I don't know what it is, but people are buying it, and uh, I'm going to continue to ride the wave. Um for a little bit longer and see what happens. Yeah, that's fine. I actually, golf is one of those, like I don't worry about missing out on players as much in PGA as opposed to other sports where like you actually can miss out because pricing is designed in terms of like, you know, like when Todd Gurley gets the start for the first week in NFL, it's like his price will rise and there's definitely some don't want to miss out there. But like, and I talked about it in the article on Vegas-based pricing, like missing out doesn't really happen with 
golfers prices as much because they're designed they're forward looking they're a lot like designed to be a lot more inefficient so everyone else is on them like i guess i just kind of treat it as like this oddity of like all right everyone else is hopping on a train i'm not on but like i have my rules uh and if i'm gonna stick i'm i I gotta stick to my rules that's the best this replacement for like subjective judgment that i have fair enough yeah Yeah. makes makes sense to me i totally get it and uh yeah, unless you hear a convincing argument that really makes sense. Otherwise, why would you deviate? If you're deviating, you're, you know, guessing and not making good decisions. Well, yeah, so. exactly. This shouldn't be guesswork. Right. Yeah, and no, I agree with you, Colin, on, on list. Yeah, if you look at his long-term missed cut percentage, not very good. Um, okay, we, we will uh, – well, I guess I'll have one more question to end it. Um, most popular golfer. So you can, I, I guess, maybe um, the highest-owned golfer or maybe the, the – most popular one in cash games. Do you think it's guys think it's going to be Rory or who? Um, I don't know. I could, I could see Holmes crashing the party this week. Like I think he's decently cheap. There's a decent set of results. Are people still scared of his injury? Like, I I don't know. Um, This one's tough. Yeah. I just, I'll, I'll go Holmes, but I don't know if I really like that pick. Um, I feel pretty confident to be one of three guys. I think it's going to be Holmes, Glover, or Fino. Interesting. Okay. I'm okay. pretty confident. And, and if I, I'd be really confident if I could throw Rory in there. Uh, and maybe for tournaments he will be, but for cash games, I don't know. It, we'll, we'll see what happens there. But if I could throw him yeah. in there, I'm pretty sure he'll be one of those four guys. <clears throat> Interesting. Yeah, and it seems sort of how we uh, went over our tiers, uh, that the really, really good value plays um, are going to be in that middle tier. So. Um, yeah, I think it's well, one it's, other it's, nerdy correlation thing too. Just to, to, if we're going to predict, and Colin will understand why. It's it's likely to either be Rory or Glover, and they'll both probably be one and two if that's the case, just because roster construction correlated or, outcomes. Yeah, right. Or it's going to be you know JB. Um, yeah, I, th- I think JB and has Fino. Got Fino. <laughs> yeah. So we'll see. But, I think yeah. Fino is probably the least. I, I don't know. Initially, I thought he might be heavily on. We'll see if he, how how much people caught on to him. Makes sense. Okay. Uh, we will end it there. Uh, thanks everyone for listening. Um, I know it was sort of a, a frustrating tournament to follow last week in the Zurich Classic and the rain and everything, but uh, I think we got a good tournament coming up in Wells Fargo, good weather, and hopefully you guys uh, uh, do your research and get into our player models and read our content. And We still have more coming out tomorrow, so uh, uh, stay tuned, but thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Good luck this week. We'll talk to you guys next week.